Okay, I seem to have that. Um, and uh, we're just getting ready to record this morning's event. So uh, just give me 30 seconds and uh, I'll be with you. We will get in. The recording started and we can hear you loud and clear. That's great. I'm going to get started then. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, I think we've got quite a number of people registered for, for this webinar. And I think for the first time, we've got some, uh, some overseas people joining us as well. So uh, welcome to that. Um, so this morning's presentation is about the size of UK HE capability model project. Uh, we've come up with a more happy title. And, uh, and the bar is going to be given by myself, Ian Lister. Um, that photo there was when I used to model for the CNA clothing catalogue. Because uh, I'm talking about CNA, you'll probably realise how old I am. Um, I worked for Coventry University for about 27 years, um, maybe more than that, but I sort of started to lose count. And for the last few years, I've been the lead for the size of enterprise architecture community of practice and uh, that group who, who's on this webinar this morning. So um, I think a good um, presentation practice suggests that I'm supposed to tell you uh, what I'm going to tell you. So uh, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the need for a capability model uh, and what we could idea. Uh, we're going to talk about the Cordit model. Um, now, I'm aware that, that there will be a number of people on the call this morning who have a business architecture, enterprise architecture background. And there the will be a point today, I suspect, where I, I might be teaching you to suck eggs. I apologize for that. But I'm also aware that we have quite a number of people who may not have that background. Um, so I'm trying to hit a middle ground here. The other thing to say, I should have said right from that, is that I am suffering from a bad case of man flu. Uh, as this uh, presentation continues, I will begin to sound more and more like Barry White. And so I will be stopping for... Uh, Slips and tea every now and then, and the first one will be happening now. Just bear with me. I'll discuss the Cordic model, and we will then be going on and, and uh, show the U-size model and the, and the version that we're at at the moment. And I need to sort of set expectations here today. And um, the model that we're showing is what we're calling uh, version 0.6. It's not complete, but it, it, it's fairly close. We're now getting into the sort of details uh, of the model. Um, and then I'm going to show you um, potentially um, users can use the model. And I think that's quite important because that's one of the main questions that's come back. If we're doing this exercise, how do we use the model? What benefit is it to the sector? I'm going to demonstrate some of that. We've actually tested this model uh, as we've gone along with different scenarios with some of the universities um, to make sure that it's actually meeting the needs that we uh, identified at the outset the project. And then I'm going to finish off just about with, with, with what's next and when you people we're going to release the model and, and, and the slide. So the presentation is going to take about 35 minutes and at the end of that there'll, there'll be questions um, if, if anybody's got any. Um, so the C model. Um, I'm aware, or a lot of people will be aware that Cordit, uh, which is the Australian and New Zealand version of a uh, size model out uh, a little while back, which was their version of the HE capability model. And a number of people saw this and thought what a good idea it was. Um, so in my role within the, the enterprise, I asked the sector whether people thought that we'd have one for, for, for the UK. Uh, and there was quite an overwhelming response to say, yes, that would be an idea. Um, that, that's the project. In terms of a capability model, it really shows what the organization does, uh, what the value streams are, um, and what the things that enable that business to work. It's about the who or the how. In modeling, I think for somebody that's worked in enterprise architecture and business analysis, it's probably the most stable form of modeling. And an example of that, uh, when I first came into the sector, I was head of English uh, for this university, uh, income, and we had a um, capability at the time which would have been for, like academic fees management. Now, five years ago, people turned up at the students 
end up at the camp centre and they would have paid for their academic fees by um, cash, credit card. The vast majority with a thing called a check. You're under, you don't know what a check is. That's your parents. Um, now, we have that capability about academic management, but the things that facilitate that are completely different. Now is it's about students enrolling online, the, the invoice being generated automatically, and people making fees uh, online. Um, so the capability remains the same, but the facilitator have changed over time. So for me, it's quite a stable model. It also allows us to overlay technology for business activities. And I think the key for that is that what it allows us to do as as predominantly IT people, is to have a conversation with the business, to present that common language. And more and more we're needing to do that. You know, it's always been that there's been a, a, a disparate um, group in terms of IT and the business. We more and more we recognise that we need that common language. Hopefully when we get down to some of the demonstrations about how we use the model, obviously demonstrating about how it's relevant. Project, as I say, um, I asked the sector whether we should do this. Um, it came back that we that we would. Uh, that'd be a good idea. So uh, we put a project team together, and we first met in Coventry back in March in 2017. Uh, from the outset, we, we decided that we would have a, you know we wanted to, to, to show the project was going to achieve the things that we were expecting. So we've listed these here. And we have a website for the project, um, and I'll give details of that uh, at the end. And really, it was the three main elements. Obviously, anything that we did benefit the organisation, the the, uh, the users. Um, but so we were very keen that it should help facilitate, uh, <coughs> excuse me, collaborative working, shared services with, across the uh, the sector. Um, because I honestly believe that that is the way forward um, in many things that we'll do. And um, at a parochial level, uh, for myself, I was aware that the EA community practice, um, unlike other USAISA groups, didn't really have anything that it owned. And if you look at PNG, it will have documents around project management, business analysis. The, the USAISA EA group doesn't have that. And I, I felt that for it to develop and grow, that it needed something that it owned. So they were, they were the main drivers for this. In um, the audit model, um, what would be great is obviously is if I could call up the audit model onto uh, on screen and put our model next to it. Um, for those who uh, like to get a copy of it, you'll you'll be aware that um, audit have quite a number of um, restraints around that, and they certainly don't like it to be shared publicly. If you want a copy of the model, you can get it, and we 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 talk about that on our website. Um, will be to be shared publicly and and these webinars we we make public and you size are quite rightly i think share everything they do um so we, we can't do that this morning but let's just talk about for those that have seen it and talk about why we're just not using it in an exact copy of the core model we for our model uh, eventually is probably more a, a pure architecture model um, and to ensure that that was something that, that, that we standardized, um, we created a definition of a capability. And this is something that went through about three or four iterations. Um, having then created that capability, we then looked at um, the capabilities that were identified on the Cordit model. And quite a number of them failed um, the test, if you like, of, of our definition. An example I can give of that, I think on the Cordit model, it there but one of the capabilities is general ledger. For us, that wasn't a capability. Um, so you won't find that our model. We need to be um, a bit more descriptive in our definitions of what a capability is, okay, of the capabilities. The, I think on the model, there's something like 150 capabilities. If you look at it one, in, in some areas, um, I think it's the there will be a little bit more work needed on some of them. So it's something that says um, resource, you know, capability that is resource management. 
definition is the management of resource. We try to be a bit more descriptive about this, and I can tell you that within the project team, um, it's become a major competition. Uh, unfortunately, I've had mine reviewed by Claire and Rick from uh, Portsmouth, who uh, nails me every time with everything I write. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's been uh, quite a thing within the project team. What also try to do is, is reduce duplication. So, um, on the Cordic model, you will see that there is something like resource and um, staff um, improvement management. But if you look at the resource model, I think there's something in the there that says um, reach um, staff recruitment. Always felt that one sat below the other, you know, one would one take the other. Now, I wouldn't we've removed all of them, um, but um, we, we've done our best to try and do that. Change the overall structure of the model. Um, and um, you'll see, for those that see the model, uh, I'll talk through that. And I am going to show you the model and go through some of the aspects of it in a moment. And um, in addition, what we've done is we've added a, 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 a new stream. And so it, the value propositions on the, the Cordic model are, are teaching and learning and research. We have a, we have a third one, which is, is commercial activity. Okay, so bear with me. Now, having said all that, it sounds like I'm being quite critical of the Cordic model. I'm absolutely not. Um, what I can do is that when we sat down in March to look at this model, um, it's in us now to really only get to version 6, and we're still having a lot of discussions and recognising there are issues wrong with it. And we have starting from a blank sheet of paper. So, um, absolute admiration and credit to the, the, the people at Cordic who started and created this model from scratch. But when I um, put this team to, when I, I asked the volunteers to come to, together to help on this project, um, what um, I didn't realize at the time was that I honestly could not have handpicked a better group of people uh, to assist with this. And if you'll just bear with me for a moment, um, I just want to take a step to the, to the left and, and just thank these individuals personally. And if you ever use this model, Model. These are the group of people that uh, you uh, you need to thank. So um, the project team is Alistair Holmes from Lincoln, Claire Unwin Unwin Reed from Portsmouth, uh, Ali, who many will know from HESA, uh, Luke Smith uh, from the University of Western England, and John Townsend, who uh, when the project started was with MU, but is now a consultant in the sector. Now, when you look at this picture, it does look like the project has been sponsored by you size around the Adams family, uh, but I can tell you that as a group, um, we all look so much better in the flesh, um, but I'm, I'm still surprised that Claire doesn't feel the, the need to uh, share her photo with everybody else, but uh, I do want to say, uh, from me, uh, a massive thank you to this group of individuals and their uh, time and effort and for their organisation that have helped pull this model together. Okay, so the model. That's it. In its, uh, in its latest form, uh, version 6, coffee. Right from the start, I need to, to set a few expectations. Uh, when, you, uh, when we go through this model, and I'm going to go through each layer, I'm not going to go through all the capabilities, I'm just going to touch on it for the time being, and it may be later so that we run uh, webinars that talk about each of the layers or go through specific aspects of the model. That isn't for today, you, you'll be glad to hear. Um, but through the model, you, you may and you'll say, well, well, we don't call a capability like that. We would structure it that way. We wouldn't put um, those, those capabilities together. That's absolutely fine. This is a generic AG capability model. So this is what we're doing. No, I'm sure what we're doing is that we are supplying to the sector a model that you can take away and hopefully we've done 80% of the work for you and you can take it out of the box and use it or you can start amending it uh, as you see fit to, to, to work in your organization so um, just please bear that in mind as, as we go through it and I'll, I'll probably make that point again because it because it is important so in terms of the model and um, the red section right at the top is is part is our model is different in its structure. Um, you'll see that what we've done is that we've raised 
strategy and governance and organizational structure to a much higher level, we've made it more prominent. Um, now, only last week, uh, somebody pushed out in the project team, actually, architecturally, we've drawn that wrong. Uh, so we'll need to amend it. Um, and when the next version, 0.7, comes out shortly, in the next couple of weeks, and this will look slightly different. So that's the third level, as I say, just lifting up the things that we think are, are very important to the organization and put them all prominent within the model. Um, is, um, the is we probably spent the most amount of time on it is closest to the finish, um, and this is the teaching and learning uh, value stream. Um, and I want to give you an idea at this, at this point about why it's quite difficult to do the exercise. And if you are going to change the model in any way, something you need to consider. I, right from the last step, never considered that there would be an issue over the, the, the teaching and learning. Now, since learn, there are a number of universities that actually refer to it as learning and teaching. So we have a debate over that. That moment, if you then take that for the 150 um, abilities on there, you'll start to get a feel for how complex this becomes in trying to, uh, to create an area model. And this is the teaching and learning level, and um, this is the one I think that most universities uh, are, are, are most interested in. Uh, and it's the area where we've done most of our scenario testing so far. Research. Um, now, this is very similar. This is the one area that, that, that changed very little from the, uh, the core model. And there's two reasons for that. The first is the cup of tea. If anybody's counting. Um, the two reasons are that we spent the least amount of time looking at it and when the group, the project team, meets later in the year. Uh, and, and this is one of the areas that we'll be focusing on. Uh, and we have had some some research um, individuals look at this, and, and their comment was that actually it's our box is pretty much what we do in terms of research, and, and the reason for that is, is that unlike teaching and learning, it's much more collaborative. So processes around the world tend to sort of align anyway. Um, so Wilson will take views on it. Of this webinar today is, is that um, at the end we won't be giving the model a in any other format other than this presentation on these slides but we are looking asking for people to look at the model and comment on it and um, you know is there any, any glaring mistakes on, on it I'll be honest with you if you're coming back and, and want to do semantics here and there and um, we'll, we'll sort of run with the majority on those but we are looking for feedback on it and whether it's going to be useful and whether the exercise that we've done or is it the significant changes that we could make. So, as I said, that's the research model. The change that we've made in terms of ours being a, another value proposition is that it's commercial activity uh, level. About that, um, that's the standing, I think, in enabling capabilities within the uh, the coding model, we felt that actually it was a proper piece of stream and a lot of organizations in our sector are now making commercial activity that sits outside T and L and um, research and will have um, called, uh, subsidiaries. And so we've we've included that in there and put it in a value stream. If your organization doesn't, that's fine. But I keep saying it, this is a generic model. And finally, this is the enabling capabilities uh, level. And um, as you can see, um, we, we're fairly similar to the corporate model, but we've, we've changed the semantics uh, on quite a few of them. Um, there are, I've gone through it a few times, and there are some spelling mistakes and those sorts of things, but we, we're going to proofread it and, and get others to look at it as the model becomes uh, closer to, to finish. Um, <coughs> excuse me, people do ask, is it? Why isn't it in functional groups? Well, because of your capability model, we've not designed that way. But you could take these things, and in terms of information management, uh, such like an information communication, you could turn that into an IT department if that's what you wanted. 
Okay, so um, very, that was a very brief look at the model. As I say, I didn't want to go into any great detail at the moment. This is really just an opening shot to, to show the sector what we're doing. Um, in terms of um, talk about next is really about how the model can be used uh, and some of the scenarios that we've tested it again. From this, right from the outset, that what we've created is, uh, and I talked about that common language. If you're having a meeting today to, to kick off a new project, and we're going to make changes within your organisation, this is something you could print off in A3 format, stick in the wall, start having a conversation about which areas of the university we're going to affect it. You know, that's it at its very basic level. One of the other things that you might know when you look at the model is that. Um, some of the capabilities you may feel you can break down to lower levels and um, we couldn't do that particularly with this model and, and the reason for that is the model here is shown uh, in level zero so the red bit and the purple the dark purple bit would, would be level zero capability uh, there's the level one capabilities with sort of a darker grey and the level zero uh, so the level uh, two capabilities are in white uh, or to grey um, you can go lower that. You can go to any level that you, you, you. But for us, trying to create a generic model, it becomes much more subjective and uh, very institutional focus at that point. But as an example, I wanted to show that. That, for instance, you could have. Um, we have a capability which is group uh, strategic plan development. Your organisation might feel that it wants to, to break capability and show how that. That's constructed through an IT strategic plan or a state strategic plan, the finance strategic plan, etc. Uh, but we we didn't go to that level, and our model won't ever go to that. But you might want to do it in your organisation. Okay, in terms of uses, uh, I'm going for another drink. I introduce a couple of concepts here uh, in Polda and Obashi. Uh, people may be aware of these, uh, but um, I think there are some, these are the things that then are taking the model, which is very one dimensional, and um, an extra layer to it and making the whole model richer. I pull here the scholarship and bursary management, not a great example, but it works here, I think. And so that there may be capabilities that sit under that, which are bursary application management and scholarship application management. Now, what we can to do is put attributes around that. So in terms of um, Poldat, um, that process, organization, location, data, application, and technology, the back is owners, business processes, applications, systems, hardware, and infrastructure. The idea, if you're going to do these, take your pick. The examples I'll be giving will be with uh, Poldat because that's the one that I, I know most. Um, who have done uh, enterprise architecture before, you went from that, that uh, in, when we talk in, in three layers for business analysis, which are business, uh, application, and technology, and the organization, location, sorry, just bear with me, sorry, my phone's going off, I'm sure that isn't important, so I'm turning it off. Sorry, a sip of tea while I can. The, uh, in terms of business application and technology layers, if you if you look at the Polder example, process, organization, and location, probably the business layer. Data of a funny one, but we could say that it sits within the application layer with the application, and obviously T is the technology layer. So how would that, that work in real life? So if I hate the scholarship and bursary, and what we say is that in terms of the, the, the values for bursary management, we have a process around that. It's owned by our student services. It is located and we offer bursaries on the main campus and in the college. The sets for student and debt are required to facilitate this. And um, we use the applications, our, our student records, and our finance systems, and the technology is there as well. For the scholarship, that's slightly different. Uh, it's, it's, there's a process, but it's owned by finance. It's only on the main campus. The data, the, the data is different because it needs to understand a course the student is on because only certain courses have scholarships. 
And then we have the application and, and technology levels again. Now, for me, this is a, a little bit of a revelation because I'm somebody that's, uh, that's often that if you want to do enterprise architecture, then you really need an, an EA tool with a repository. Then you could take the 150 capabilities on the model, put them in a column in Excel, and I've got six other columns, poll that, process, organization, location, etc. I'm listing those for all those capabilities. And then you have quite a rich set of data about how your organization is run. I suspect something that virtually most organizations wouldn't have in one central place. So when you were coming to plan change and you wanted to do something around storage adversary management, you've got a bit of information already there. Take that further. So a, um, an example where uh, one of the, the, the strategies for the organization is to increase student numbers. And to do that, one of the requirements will be to recruit more elite students. So we will scholarship. Now, we talked about that we're going to have this set of attributes that will facilitate that. But we know that this will probably touch on other capabilities. So it will touch on student recruit, domestic student recruitment, and potentially student health and well-being. We might want to offer uh, free massages and physiotherapy to these the students. So... This is what I think that at the start of a project, somebody like a business analysis would do, and we send them away to find this information out. Again, if you have this in a central repository, how much quicker are you moving the project forward and doing the analysis phase? Um, and that's just really from just a very basic set of attributes linked to a capability. And it is about then starting to have a, a general set of, um, of information that can be easily shared around and the organization. So this is the, um, in terms of sharing and planning, um, that we have a strategy which is to increase student numbers, and then the requirements will, will have more students and more international students, and the ability to deliver those of domestic student recruitment and international student recruitment. However, um, pretty much every organization out there, I'm sure, is more, running more than one uh, project linked to strategic aim. Um, but what quite often happens is, and we, we see this in certain testing the, the, the model in certain scenarios, is to believe there's, there's a, a disconnect. And quite often, areas, certain areas that work on particular projects don't know what others are working on. There may also be strategic aims to outsource all of these activities and also to, to make business and applications much more efficient. Uh, we have requirements to outsource international student recruitment and replace international student recruitment portal. And of course, they have an impact on that capability. They have an impact on that capability and they will have an impact then on those attributes that we've talked about previously. So we're looking at making changes to that capability and its component parts. We can actually be considering all projects in one go. And this is just a visual representation. And it's that thing about, apparently a found words. I was at an event the other day where a senior um, officer was talking and was saying, in this day and age, it, whatever you try and represent in words, if you can represent it in a model, the likelihood is that it will be, uh, it's more likely to be considered by senior management because you know, those people just don't read even on a sheet of paper. They want to see it visually represented in a picture to start with. I talked about shared services and collaborative working and main systems. Now, in terms of this example, it's very simplistic. But it, again, we were kind of I had a conversation with somebody yesterday, I think it might have been Alex Lee, and we were talking that we think at the moment we're aware of about 30 universities who are looking at replacing or doing something with their measure with their student record systems. You kick that project off today. Way is that what you could do is that you could lay this model down on the table and just have a real simple, high-level discussion about the things that you are looking for a new system to deliver or that you might want to do in terms of shared uh, shared services or collaborative working. 
So it may be as an organisation in terms of product management, that's where the magic is for your organisation. You've built an in-house system, so you don't want to outsource that. The subtraction, you want that to be a student record system. So very quickly, you can just start identifying the key areas that are affected by projects or, or what it is you're looking to undertake. And it's, I've done it here in big box. You can do it right down at the capability level and say what's in, what's out. Sorry, I'm going for a cup of tea again. Okay. Um, so i you a couple of examples from universities and where they've done. So the thing about this example, is that it's, uh, it looks like it's in a different format. Uh, well, actually, uh, it's only a version of the model when we were testing it, and it's actually in Visio. And um, when we uh, first got together to discuss um, how we how we would run this project, one of the outputs we decided was that we couldn't just release it in an Archimate uh, template because a lot of universities uh, don't have the facility to use that. And so the final model will they be released in a Visio, a Visio version. Um, and that's one of the things that you need to thank us about, because believe me, uh, trying to convert this model into a, Visio, into a workable Visio model is quite complex, but uh, we've, uh, we are doing that. And see what this organisation, what this university has done, is simply just taken the, the top level of business capabilities for uh, teaching and learning. And they've started to identify the supporting system it's quite interesting. If you look at uh, student admissions there, which has four capabilities, it has uh, three times uh, the systems to support it, which is interesting, and, and that, that might be right. But it, it starts facilitating that conversation. It makes people uh, ask, you know, do we need all those uh, systems to support those capabilities? Are we getting maximum value from them? The other thing that they've done is on the right hand side is that they've uh, identified a key on there and just started touching against each capability, which capabilities are affected by those um, strategies. Uh, by the strategies. Again, that, that really aids playing uh, in terms of what you're going to do in terms of resource. So it's a good, it's a good example of, 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 of what you do with the model simply. The two examples are from from one university, and, and they've done it using a, um, a tool. Um, and um, is a heat map to show um, KT first line owners. Uh, and it's going around and saying to the people in your organization, here's a capability. Do you think you're a first line owner in that? You'll notice that alumni um, engagement far on the right, nobody other than alumni thinks they own that. That's absolutely fine. You get a student attraction and recruitment everybody feels that they've got to say and first line everything so and that's not unusual it could be faculty um, it could be your international office it could be your uh, marketing people um, it could be your, your recruitment office but to appreciate then how difficult it is to make changes in that or at least start to identify the number of key stakeholders in the project it's really about, similar to the, to the other um, one in Visio, it's about a linking capabilities to strategic projects. And I think I can say that, strategic projects. Um, and you see with, with this organization, again, um, the into student attraction and recruitment, that's where a lot of um, the strategic projects are taking place. Again, that's not surprising. You know, I, I suspect most universities at the moment are focusing very heavily on what they do around um, student attraction and, and recruitment. <clears throat> but if you put the two models together here, what you start to realize is that this organization has quite complex issues around student attraction and recruitment. And that, um, and what they actually did was when they saw the two models, they actually decided that what would be useful is to have an away day and get everybody around the table and talk around what they were to do. And again, this was a, a, it was a visual representation. Everybody could pick up on that. It wasn't a thousand words on a bit of paper. The other thing you could do here, and we, we've not done it, is what, as, a, as a B department or as an organization, you could perhaps overlay it uh, with, with what your capital spent, what your, what your expenditure is as an organization. And 
in each of those capabilities and see if it matches where you think doing the work. Um, few uh, slides and then I'll be finished, you'll, you'll be glad to know. Um, and uh, if there will be any questions, uh, then pull through to me. Let's talk a little bit about data. And um, data is big in our sector, as we know. GDPR is uh, something that we're all going to deal with. And, and obviously, uh, with the heat and the data future pro, um, project, there are, there are all looking at how we manage our data, what our innovation and data strategies are. Excuse me. And, and this is just an example of potentially where we could do something around this. Now, the, the, the Cordic model comes with a data model with it. Uh, and anybody who saw Dave Dayton's pre, um, webinar last month will identify that he's put a, a data model and he used that to help facilitate his work at Birmingham. So this is a little bit about what we're doing around data, but fully about understanding how this is useful. In terms of the student application management process, that's probably the point where we um, we gather most of our student data, and we call that in our student record application. That data is then probably shared more than any other around the organisation. I've just given a few examples of that here. Interesting is that what this model can start to show us is that we're creating the data at this point, we're storing it in the student record system, and we could say this now becomes our golden source for that data, and we can start to manage that. And once we get down to looking at the processes for all the other capabilities um, and the data sets within there, we can see how this data is then protected, and ensure that this data is then protected further down the, the value stream. So that's something that we might want to do. In terms of what we may do in terms of supporting data with this model, uh, this is our earliest draft of a, a, a data model to, to support the capability model. It's structured in a way that is uh, similar to, to that of the, of the main model. And, and we'll spend a bit more time on this, um, just to make sure that it, that it works trying to do, uh, and we've been uh, led very much by the work that, that uh, we've done, and, and we're very grateful to have Alex Lee with us on this, is trying to take the capability model, the data model, see how well and more effectively we can overlay it with the HESA uh, data model. So, we uh, um, as I said earlier, that the, we've created a set of student data, We've represented that student data. We say, well, how does that match with what he's sort of proposing in terms of their logical data model? Mm -hmm. And how will that best support what we're trying to do with um, uh, ESA? Uh, now, it's early days. It's very simplistic and it's very difficult uh, to think that, that's happening with that. And, uh, and I'm leaving that to Alex. And it may be that uh, later on there's a webinar uh, to talk through in a bit more detail. But it's about what we can do with this model and make it sort of great with some of its parts and really add value to it. And, and we're interested that if anybody's got any thoughts on any of that, really get back to us. Uh, that's about it from me. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about the, the next steps. Uh, we're just coming up to about 20 to, to 11. Um, what we do is finalise the model components uh, and really make sure that we we, we we're happy with, with the structure of the model, uh, as I said, we get feedback on that. But at that point, <coughs> excuse me, and at that point, oh, drink. And, um, which I'm, I'm hoping will be some time this side or just the other side of Christmas. Um, we will start to, to have the, the model independently assessed by um, enterprise architects and, and, and design. And, have agreed to do that for us. Uh, and then we'll look at the, the structure of the model and, and comment on it, uh, and we'll take feedback from them. Because as I said, we'd like it to be as pure as a, an enterprise architecture thing as, as we can make it, but still ensuring that it's relevant and, and useful to the sector. Um, 
then need to consider the the options around associated data outputs um, and the models to support that. And uh, say, and particularly, we're taking a lead from Alex on that. And I think when we get to uh, pause for our next meeting in early December, again, will be one of our main focuses. Um, and it may be that we release the the, the capability model and, and the the data model comes just after that. But we'll, we'll see. In terms of the model, um, it the version one uh, will be Q1 for 2018. Now, um, when um, I put the uh, suggestions to um, the size about running this project, um, the delivery date was um, <clears throat> to be before the size domain conference in March. Um, I don't see reason why that won't be the case. Um, uh, and as, as soon as we're happy. happy um, that we think that we have a, um, a workable model, then we will release it to the sector. And as I say, we will do that in both our keynote uh, format and we will be in MS video. And I, we, we thought some discussion about doing something in Archie as well, uh, which is the free tool uh, available to everybody to download, but it, but it doesn't have the repository with it. Um, but we'll. Um, We'll review that further. Our concentration at the moment is really to get the model out there and get people to use it. So, I think that's it from me. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you. Um, this, this is about the eighth or ninth webinar that we've run. Uh, the technical bit in the background is run by a colleague of mine, Mansell Mir, who uh, never gave any thanks for these, so I'd just like to go on a record of thanking him. Uh, the project website is there, and um, I think we are now open to questions. So um, I need to do something, and uh, I need to go to chat and questions there. So I'm not getting anything at the moment. So we'll give up a couple of minutes. If we don't get any, then we'll, we'll end this. We are recording this, uh, by the way. Right, uh, there's one. Uh, the histological model covers just students' data, other capabilities we need, so the KP model. If the format we expand to cover, it covers uh, the plan. Uh, sorry, the histological model it does um, it is for the student information because uh, I think um, uh, Alex may put something out uh, after this presentation if if I'm saying that wrong. But the histological model is just for mainly about students, and courses, and types of things. Um, in terms of commercial and research, that's why we're having a, a data model model and um, it won't be the, lo the logical level um, to try and pull that um, but I asked talk to Alex about that and he might want to put something out a bit later and um, get a question better than I can I'll that ball on to be honest <laughs> People here, uh, so if you are at uh, PCMG or this uh, NCSIG conference, then please come along the way. Or if you know somebody's going, you've got questions, please come and find me. Uh, you know, he'll put something out to explain that. Thank you for that, Alex. I'm assuming you, I can't see the names on it, but I'm assuming that's from you. How would you see the relationship between a capability model and a service catalog? Um, right. My view on that is that I think that you take capabilities and elements of capabilities, the component parts, to build services. We've done a little bit of that here in Coventry, but we need to look to look a bit further because obviously services are made up of of different capabilities, effectively, all their component parts. Um, it's a difficult one, but that, but there is a relationship. And if anybody's done anything with it, um, it would be useful to get their comments on it. But that's my view of it. There is there's something there. I'm not quite sure that we've nailed it here yet, uh, and I've not heard from anybody who's done anything with it. But that, that's certainly how I think it would work. Is it? But um, you're taking the elements and. In, Constructing those into those services, um, which would formally formulate your, your service catalog. Certainly in our repository here at 
Coventry, I, I REA um, that very much is structured around our service catalogue, so comms and communications all have the capabilities and all the attributes sitting um, to that for mobile phones and um, online conferencing and those things. <clears throat> so some of the, I'm skipping through a little bit, I think, so just bear with me. Did we look at the iTurner learning and teaching model? We've looked at lots of uh, different models, and um, we, the one that I, did, I didn't say that I probably should have, is that it, we, we actually tried to get Cordit on board with this, um, and for the reason that they didn't want to engage, we tried, uh, there were six different people we tried to get engaged, and we even got the head of Cordit involved, uh, but it never happened. So we, we looked at the iChina model and we looked at the Horror model. Um, and basically what we tried to do is come up with something that we thought um, was a, the, the best of those and, and, and mix them together. Uh, our, our main focus, though, was probably called it and, and then the Horror model. <clears throat> Going benefits to the capability model, have the team talked about ways of measuring these benefits? And so that at the moment is... No, um, and isn't that always the worst part of any project? And when somebody says, right, go back and now measure the benefits. Um, no, is, to be honest, is, is, is the answer to that. Um, I think that the fact that we're sitting having a conversation on the forum of capability modeling, um, it sort of meets some of the things that I wanted to do around that. And then tested the model um, in, in universities, um, we wanted to universities to see if it works and met their needs. Um, and for the most part, the feedback on that has been positive. Then I think we're starting to we can say that we're starting to meet the institution needs. Um, but that middle one, that middle column that I showed, which was around collaborative working um, at the moment, um, the, <laughs> and the collaborative working goes on in our sector, not enough. Probably. And that's probably one area where we've not demonstrated that at the moment. You know, I, I, I didn't talk on that we, that we could do is that um, obviously once there are ways, there are quite a few documented ways of um, capabilities. So I think CMMI uh, is one that has uh, a standard for assessing capabilities. And although I think it's, I think, I'm not the next one, it's, it's around software development. Uh, one quick look at it, you could actually quite quickly come to something and, and make up uh, a testing ground your capabilities and sort of assess their maturity and how effective they were. So that's something else that could happen. Uh, don't see any of the comments coming in. I just want to go back to if I miss anything. Positive five. If I've not answered your question or you need a more fuller answer, so then please contact me or stick on the forum. Stick it on the EA forum and have a conversation, have a conversation around it. It's great. So, um, okay, well, it's coming up to, well, it's just about 10 to 11. Uh, I think we're done. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for the time this morning. I hope it'll be useful. And uh, we'll speak all again soon. So, okay, take care. Bye.